Welcome to How's the Market, a podcast from your friends here at Keeping Current Matters, where we host conversations that will help you save time and build confidence so that you can stand out as the market expert. I'm your host, David Childers, and today's conversation is with Jim McMahon. Jim is a mortgage industry expert. He's been in the industry over 30 years, done over a billion dollars worth of transactions, and today is the president of Benchmark Home Loans. And I want you to listen for three things that Jim and I talk about. First of all, the Fed's action and how that impacts mortgage rates right now. Two, the role builders are playing in this market and their impact on inventory. And three, as a real estate professional, Jim lays out what you can do and what you can control in this market. So Jim, how's the market? So Jim, I'm grateful to have you back on the podcast. Welcome. Thanks, buddy. Good to see you, David. It's good to see you. And I, I always enjoy our conversations. I know you're there in the mountains and made time for us to talk today. You always have such a unique perspective on the market and financially how the market's doing and how that impacts our business. And so let's start there. We're here in the summer. It's been a a year now that we've been in this market, right, of sort of the the quickest rise in interest rates last year. You've talked about that, but give me your perspective on where we are right now, where we sit. Well, it's interesting, isn't it? I think one of the main focuses we'll talk about today that we always do in, in, in blessing others is what you can control and what you can't control because that line gets blurred every day for professionals, even the best of us in our uh, mortgage banking and real estate professional. And so, you know, looking at where we're at today, David, I mean, it's a hard, it's been a hard market. It's been a difficult market, combinations of uh, less volume, low inventory, uh, rising rates. And yes, we all made it through, suffered through the fastest rise uh, in a 180 day period in interest rate recorded history. It's going to happen from April of last year through November, December. And we still rose a little more here at the first of the year, but those three-quarter tightenings and just nonstop. So where we're at today on that uh, that we'll get into is the Fed has paused, but they haven't verbally paused. They're still verbally trying to crush us. Right. (laughs) You've always referred to that, Jim, as synchronized swimming, right? Yeah, it is. Oh, they, these guys plan this stuff. It's, and I get it, their method to their madness. You know, it's some combination of their fault and the administration's fault for why they waited almost a year to fight inflation when it was running crazy. You can go back and look at videos of Janet Yellen and others saying this is transitory. It will go away. It's just an, uh, you know, after effect of COVID. And then, of course, that was not to be. But, you know, there's a double edged sword. I mean, uh, those of us in our profession had an amazing run in 20, really 2019, 2020, and 2021. Just COVID threw such a curveball at us. 22 uh, changed a lot, but there's a new landscape forming right now that we really need to talk about today that's very exciting. It doesn't mean it's easy. It's like in, in a, you know, professional athlete or something. These, these guys practice 300 some days a year to play, you know, 13 to 14 days out of a year. So that's the kind of mindset I would have right so now. So your perspective right now, and I love the, the I want to get into in just a second, controlling what you can control, staying away from what you cannot control. And that's always a constant in our business. And yeah. in a market like today, it, it elevates itself. But here's my question. There was sort of this thought that we'd move into May and we would see a lower mortgage rate environment. You know, anybody yeah. that's been paying attention, that's a loan officer, an agent, anybody in our business kind of heard that. And yet we see a very different environment. Now, you, you know, uh, trying to forecast and predict where rates are going to be, mortgage rates are going to be is on some level, you, you know, uh, 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 an attempt at something that can't be done. But break that down, why there was the thought we'd be in a lower interest rate environment and why we're not right now. Okay, great. Well, I'm going to ask you, I'm sure you'll come back with graphs, and you all at Keeping Current Matters have some of the best graphs that my industry, the real estate industry, can possibly use today because they're so up to date. And you showed a graph in the last year we did that showed that little dip in rates back in late January, early February, where we came down from mid-sevens in November, October, in 30-year fixed rates, which is crazy, right? Going from a 3.25% rate last January 5th, by the way, of 2022, to seven and a half by November, and then whoosh, we whooshed down to five and three quarters last week of January, first week of February. Huge bop 
pop in, in activity in our industry. And then the Fed immediately went, whoa, it's, there's still inflation above 6% at the time. It's now down to about 4.6, so we're getting there. But all that to say in answering your question, um, the Fed continued to tighten, although not as aggressively. They verbally have continued to threaten and be what's called hawkish, which is pushed rates up every time on your graphs. You can see when we've had that little rally, we just had one in the last 30 days, mortgage rates pushed back down to upper sixes, mid sixes, and then boom, the Fed, even though they paused, David, think about it, they're done tightening for the moment. The Fed funds rate is there at five and a quarter or so within a range of a quarter. Um, mortgage rates have moved within a half a percent by their words. Right, which, which, and, and let me ask you if this, if I have the yeah. words right, their words are, we're paused, but we may not be done, right? How much of, here's my question to you, how much of that is their eye on the housing market? Huge. Um, this Fed cycle, and that, that term Fed cycle, you know, they happen every three to seven years. If you look at history, this is my sixth or seventh one in my career. Um, and their job is to slow the economy. Well, the housing industry is 42 to 44 percent of the entire GDP, gross domestic product. And Big growth point there. Country. Big point. Yeah, so they, they go after housing to slow it. This one's been different because they're, they're not going to break the back of housing this time. And they have accepted that. And that's why they have these synchronized swimming moments where Lael Brainerd comes out or whoever. They literally plan this stuff. Um, hey, you go out, David, this week and say we probably will still tighten. Even though we've gone from four three-quarter tightenings to a half a point tightening right. to a quarter right. to a quarter to none, keep saying we're going to tighten. Here's your script. And then two days later, Bob, you say it. And then three days later, Sally, you say it. And the markets, you know, have been trained for, for 100 years. Uh, yeah. Don't you know, don't fight the Fed. And and it's still a true uh, monitor. Don't fight the Fed, as you can see. I mean, look at what happened yesterday that, or this week, you know, from when we made this recording, the jobs numbers came out and the real one comes out the first Friday of every month, right? Which happened today in July, the recording. Yesterday, the ADP number, which is a different number, measured a little bit differently, a lot more private payrolls and stuff. It had this blowout number. Well, yields just spiked yesterday. We almost matched the high that we saw in November. Not quite. Today, whoosh, almost a point back down when the real number came out and showed 209. It wasn't, it was still good, right? Uh, 100,000, you know, COVID jobs coming back, 100,000 new jobs, basically. And then wages uh, still stayed steady. They didn't increase a lot, which is good. So we're, we're going in the right direction. We're just going slower than the Fed would like to see. For example, last late summer, early fall, inflation hit 11%, right, a 42-year high. We're at 4.6 now. Yeah. Um, good number, but they want to be in the twos, and it's, it's going to take more months to get there. doesn't mean they'll tighten anymore, though. Um, and right now they've made clear they are data dependent. So might tighten again, might not. My perspective is not. That's what, that, that's what I want to get into is your perspective in that because we've talked about, okay, what the Fed's doing. They're watching the housing market. We've paused on the Fed funds rate. You've talked about how that impacts the mortgage. Which is a big deal. Right. They did not raise the Fed funds rate. Right. So we're in the middle of the year. What's the second half of the year look like relative to, let's talk about our business relative okay. to mortgage rates. Yeah. So our business, okay. Everyone's talking about, we may see a mild recession. Uh, we might've had one last year and we may have another one. I can promise you our industry, right. brother, mortgages and real estate, we've had a recession. <laughs> right. you know, if you right. measure something, from what a recession is by the general no emotional term, it's two quarters in a row of negative growth. Uh, and, and so we've had two quarters, maybe three out of four right. uh, in the real estate mortgage industry where profits were down, you know, negative growth, blah, blah, blah. We still did okay. Those of us who know how to play the game, um, and I say that, it's been tough um, as a mortgage owner and a longtime originator, yeah. you know. But when I look at the second half, I see better for us. Um, because, again, the Fed's playing their game, they're hawkish, but repeat, that which we can't control, that which we can't, and that which we know for a fact, and that which we think we know. Well, the part we know is the Fed just paused. 
And you look historically when they pause, they're usually done. They've only tightened again like one or two times ever in their history. Wow. They pause. Yeah, that's a big deal. That's a big point, right? There. A few percent because they're now data dependent. So you just got this jobs number. You'll have more uh, uh, inflation numbers coming out in the next two weeks before their next meeting coming up in July. Uh, you know, whatever you see this, it's, it's all relevant. But um, as long as that inflation number keeps coming down, my prediction is they're going to get to the meeting and then they're going to say, well, we still think there's more work to be done. Right. They're, we still think that, that rates will be higher longer, but we're going to pause again to be data dependent. Right. So now they can go into the pause game where they keep kicking the market's butt and trying to keep rates up. Um, because remember that the other game that they have without tightening the Fed funds right now, that they've tightened it the most times, you know, 11, 12 times in a row, fastest rise in history, all that stuff we talked about. They also have this thing called quantitative tightening. There's a thing called quantitative easing right. they did during COVID, yeah. quantitative tightening. They can go sell, uh, you know, they have just a trillion dollars or so of bonds on their balance sheet that they bought. They, they go sell that into the marketplace by dumping that extra um, supply into the market that pushes rates up a little bit. And they know that and they know how to play that game very well. And they're doing it, by the way. So, so um, let me see if I understand this. And I just want to repeat yeah. it back to you for people that are listening. The Fed's got the tools of the Fed funds rate. They've got the the the, the tightening that you just uh mentioned um because we go through times like the last couple of years we hear the word quantitative easing right, right? this is the reverse of that quantitative uh when they were buying 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 right. bought all the way up till april of last year right. 2022 when inflation had been running for eight months they were still buying hundreds of billions of dollars in bonds it was stupid yeah yep. so, so so they've got these levers they're watching the housing market we see rates at uh, over seven right at seven maybe over seven right now depending on what you're what you're looking at and yep. your outlook for the second half of the years we see a better rate environment better real estate environment is what I hear you saying now I want to get into um, in a minute not right now what agents and loan officers can control. But I don't want to get in there yet. I want to. I want to. I want to save that for a minute. Tell me the role right now you see builders playing in this market because the issue in just about every market, Jim, and you know this, running a very large mortgage company in every state in the country, is inventory. We need more of oh, yeah. it. We need more products, specifically on the lower end. What's your perspective, given the builders that you work with and and, and manage relationships with? and what they're able to do realistically in the next six to 12 to 18 months? Great question. And so for the listener, uh, our company benchmark, about 20% of the business we'll do um, this year in 2023 is new home, wonderful builder relationships, heavily in Texas, but several yeah. nationally with national builders. Um, many of you all know. Um, and it's just developed over 30 year career um, of having those relationships will do well over a billion dollars this year and just brand new, new home stuff. So I do get a lot of insight from those folks. Uh, I know the third and command of Beezer, several just talked about Meritage, others. And, you know, it's fascinating to watch, David, because the builder is playing a role in this market that is very, very different and very unique. And I want to go backwards a minute to go forward and really okay. be specific um, because rates are what they are, right? But then when you're a home builder that has a multi-billion dollar you know, balance sheet and you're a stockholder and you've got to police stocks, uh, investors and all that stuff, you've got a different game you can play. And those folks have played huge roles. But let's make one observation. Here we are in mid-2023. Mid and in the past two weeks, you and I talking right now, the top six home builders on the New York Stock Exchange all have hit 52-week highs on their stock price. That's a, that's, wow. that's a huge point. Isn't that amazing? Um, huge. Uh, they, they can't build houses fast enough, but let's just back up six to nine months. They got their butts kicked last summer and early fall, and it wiped out a lot of the smaller players, and there's been a lot of, of consolidation industry, but all to say this, here's what was so powerful about it, because the dynamic foundation and strength of the housing market right now with so much equity, you and I should bring that right. back, back up right. out there right now, low to no defaults right now. Even with rising interest rates, it's been like leaning into a storm. Um, buyers still want to own a home for the right price and the right deal. So here's what the home builders did for us. They had, I'm talking tens of thousands of cancellations, large and small. In Last the home year you're talking about. 
between August, yeah, late July, August, September, October, November. In that period, you had the peak of rates rose into the mid sevens. Prices were screaming higher on everything. Builders had figured out by the uh, spring of last year, we got to write contracts that don't guarantee a price. Right. We don't set a price until this phase, that phase, whatever. And so all those good, innocent homeowners who were trying to own a home that had contracted on a home, they panicked. And I would have too, because here you are and you got pre-qualified for your $475,000 new home in February or March of 2022. And you did it at a rate of four and a half. And even your loan officer was smart enough to do it at five and a half because rates were rising. And you got to September and the rate was seven and the price was six twenty five, and you went, we're out. Right. And that it. happened by the right. tens of thousands, tens of thousands. And most builders worked with people. They gave back some earnest money. They canceled the deal, whatever. Some lost their earnest money. Some walked away from it, et cetera, et cetera. But here's what happened. In the months that followed then from August through November, and we watched it with the uh, dozens of builders we dealt with and helped them. They retooled. They looked at the numbers. They licked their wounds. They said, okay, this one, we have this loss, you know, all computerized and digitized, but hey, concrete prices have come down. Lumber prices have dropped 80%. We can make it up on the new ones we're building. We see demand still out there. We have to reprice and hey, lender, let's dust off that thing called a forward commitment we were doing 20 years ago where we buy uh, mortgage rates are at seven, but we as a builder, show us the number we got to write a check for we're going to give our customers five and a half. Right. Or we're going to do an incentive of $10,000 on a 550 house and they can use it for a buy down. And as fast as those builders were able to shift, they sold all their houses. January, February, March for our company, uh, we got saved by the builder uh, side of our business because um, like I remember uh, we got the, the forecast from our builder division guy and, uh, you know, I'm Chad Fleming. And um, basically, you know, in December, he tells us we're going to do 92 lower units of forecast. And then three and a half weeks later, he's like, hey, we're going to do 106 more than we thought. Right. It was crazy. And the same thing happened in February. Same thing happened in March. Over 100 plus units above what we as a mid-sized mortgage banker um, had forecast because every spec was selling. And we were right there helping because the buyers were there. They just wanted the right price and the right deal. So the home builders, and then now look again, uh the top six on the New York Stock Exchange have all hit 52-week highs in their stock price and some all-time highs. In the last two weeks, David, yeah. home builders are selling and they're leading for us well because they're showing that uh, the market is there. It's right. just you've got to have that right price, right interest rate deal. And so I know you want to transfer to this. The realtor can do the same thing. Uh, though we're teaching the realtors we deal with that, hey, don't just go reduce a price in some markets where maybe the house isn't selling or it was priced where prices were last spring, right. 2022. You know, the market's still good. Come up with incentives. Come up with you know ways to, okay, if you're trying to do a $25,000 price drop, do a 10000 and throw fifteen towards getting the rate down. That's right. what people want to feel comfortable with. Just, it's time to be creative again because the foundation of this market is phenomenal. I'm going to go that far. It's phenomenal. And I mean phenomenal from, remember, 08 and crashes like that in Fed cycles, you had huge spike in default rates in housing, which brought values way down. We don't have that, and we're not going to have that because you've got, you and I both know these stats. It's somewhere between 62 and 67%. You may have it more updated than me. I haven't looked in a couple of months. But if homeowners in America right now have a rate of 4% or less on their house, You're right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Right. that's yeah, yeah. a great thing. Even if those people stay for a while, the ones that need to move will move, and those that are staying are not going to default. Well, you know, you and I talked about this, and and you were very vocal when when we had a conversation probably six months ago that we live in the strongest real estate market foundationally of our lifetime. Right. Now, transactions down, all those things that we know about the reality of the market, but the number of folks that have a interest rate below four percent, the equity in homes across the country. The lack of defaults, you know, the, the, the extremely low default rate, um, you know, across the country for a number of different reasons, equity right. and preferred uh, interest rate. And you can't even go out and rent something for what your mortgage payment is. All the reasons that we know uh, are there. What do you – so let's let's shift into the second half of the year. 
biggest issue uh, for uh, for agents out there is is inventory. Biggest issue getting out there helping people buy given the interest rate environment. You talked when we started uh, this about controlling what you can control, right? right? So my question to you is, what can you control? And then uh, I'll hold off on that. But tell me that. Well, number one thing, you're talking to agents right now. What are you saying? This is what you can control, and this is what you need to be out there doing. Okay. Number one is what's your message, really? Not your message about the market that you're in to me, your potential customer. Yeah. Is it fear-based? Start with the big stuff because so many people have a fear-based message or an uncertain message, and I would really, really check that one. Um, And then does your message transcend through your team? What about your team? Have you taken time during this transition and more turbulent market the past year to to make sure you've got the best teammates, and that could be some has to go, you need to add to team. But in markets like this, I teach and we teach our people to go wider and find more of the fewer of the right people. Right. You know, markets like 2020 and 21 and 19, we go deeper with the uh, best clients we have because there's so much business. Um, but things you can control are market message, team. Does the whole team get the message to the marketplace that we have? And, and what I mean by that, let's take some examples. And more than ever, um, it's knowing what's available, what builders do have incentives, right. uh, everything to know about uh, the high needs of a customer coming into your marketplace. How do you go wider as a realtor? Well, so many realtors maybe have just their, their whole business built around past referrals. Have you expanded to the reload marketplace? Because in markets like now, you know, people that are moving are people that have to move, right. right? In other words, you know, I look in Texas where we're at with Austin becoming the new Silicon Valley and our Austin market's fantastic and the Dallas market is insane. With, you know, I look at just the progression still of when Toyota made their North American headquarters there. FedEx made their North American headquarters there. State Farm Insurance made their North American headquarters. Not the not just nation, North America, right. the continent. And, and we've had so much influx, um, you know, with, with a mix of everything, technology, all that. So our people, many of them went out to an HR department. In other words, they didn't just work on their past client database. They, they went wider with sources of business because even if overall business shrinks, You and I both know there's still so much business in your marketplace. One of the biggest things I've done in my coaching of loan officers over the years, I love when when someone says to me, oh, my business is slow. Oh, my realtors have slowed down. And I always pause in that moment in a coaching session. And David, I'll say, hey, do you know three people in the title business? Oh, yeah. Okay, we're going to do a 15-minute pause in our coaching session right now. I want you to rapid fire call all three people you know in the title business and just ask this quick question. Hey, Bob, it's Jim at Benchmark. How much did you guys close last month and last quarter in your office right there in central Dallas? And then call me right back, David, and and read me those three numbers. And you can get them in 15 to 20 minutes because even if you can't get the person you know at the title company, you can ask the person that they know because they know you. Right. And everybody, everybody, when I do that exercise goes, oh, wow, because it's a brain bender. You're looking at you versus looking at what the marketplace is closing, even in tougher markets. There's always more business than your human brain can even right, grasp. Right. Uh, and, and it's you expanding your message and your value proposition, because that's the other one you can control. What, here's a big one, what does my client experience look like today for a customer coming to Jim McMahon's mortgage experience at Benchmark or you know Bob or Betty at whatever real estate company? Um, that's a big one to work on today because yeah. with technology, with messaging, with lifetime client messaging, those things should be presented up front to me, the customer, so that I'm hooked in with you in a very different mindset. And I don't know that enough people are really working on that part of their business. The best agents know what's happening nationally and also know what's going on in their local market. At Keeping Current Matters, we help real estate agents become experts. And now, we've added something that will change the way you communicate. KCM Local. With KCM Local, you'll now have access to local data, national insights, and powerful visuals, all in one place. To be the local expert, visit KeepingCurrentMatters.com. Let's talk about the mindset piece, because you're talking about expanding who you're working with, 
expand, ha- having a, you know, I always, uh, you know, uh, give you credit for having a relevant market opinion based upon fact. That's what we do uh, at KCM is give people that, give people the tools uh, to develop that. But, but let's take a step back because you just said something, mindset. You've been in this business a long time. You funded, and I don't know if people know this, over a billion dollars in home loans in addition to leading a company. So you've been in the trenches. What do you say to the person that you wake up every day and you're getting shot at and you're getting, you know, hammered on a deal? You know, the reality of it. How do you keep that mindset given the world and the business we live in? Yeah, it really is huge. And and the the, the way you keep it is you have to have time for self-reflection and self-improvement. You really do. You have to time block it. You have to work on you. If, if there's if there's a fast path to a better outcome in chaotic markets or when people tell you how much you suck or you're not <laughs> right. as good as you think you are, whatever those bad moments happen for all of us in professional selling, it, it always, to me, led to, you know, I used to call it the one-hour rule, uh, and I still do it as an owner of, you know, an $8 billion mortgage company and 1,000 employees and all that. You know, I, I take time when we're working on a project or we're going through tough times or whatever to just shut down the phone, shut down the people that are most important to me. Hey, I'm not going to be available for an hour. And then I reflect on the day. Jim Rohn always said that true professionals finish the day before they start it. Mm. And that one always intrigued me when I heard that decades yeah. ago. And what did that mean? We come back to it. Um, and then, you know, the old don't wish it were easier, wish you were better, which is also a Jim Rohn quote. So when I combine those two, that's the answer for what you just said, because if you'll go take the chaos and the stuff that's happening that hurts or bullets whizzing by, part of you have to realize is it's sort of your, it is your fault. You chose to be right there in the battle. You chose to take that approach that day. And I'm not knocking you negatively. It's the old spilt the milk phenomenon. Sure. They're just ways to learn from it. And so take the time to learn from it. And that's where good scripting comes. That's where shifting who you are most valuable to. Um, who you match up best with, where, where your best referrals come from and where your worst referrals come from. Are you measuring all that? Because as good as any of us can think we are or can be, we're never going to have the entire world marketplace, but we can grow our marketplace substantially and our market share profitably by taking time. This is on time. Right? Okay. We talk about that on time versus yep. in time. Most, most realtors and mortgage Professionals spend time in their business. They're out in their field plowing and working and planting and growing, <coughs> reaping and sowing. And, well, that's good, and you're going to spend most of your time doing that. That time you'll spend on your business should be anywhere from 10 to 15, even 20% of your time sometimes is where you get just right explosion. And, and you look up and the demand of the day and the demand of everything working in our businesses, you know, you've always said, and I've, this is rung true in my mind. I think about it a lot is you're busy, but busy doing what, <clears throat> you know, in did a whole seminar series on that. <laughs> yeah. 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 Can you talk about exactly. evaluating your business from a dollar productive sort of mindset? Because right. that's what you're talking about working in the business, which is everything we do working on the business is everything you're talking about from a mindset perspective and a renewal and recharging and what's my game plan. How do you, how do you evaluate that as an owner, number one, but, but as, as you're coaching people in the business, how do you help them evaluate their business that way? Okay. Yeah. So number one, how to evaluate is, is ask the people you serve. Mm. Most people, let's hit both people that are experienced and new in the business right now. Yeah. So probably the majority watching are two years or longer in the business and they've got some track record. You actually, congratulations, right. had someone like you and believe you. Um, so don't just leave them in the dirt and send them a you know quarterly newsletter or something. Let's go back and talk to them. One of the most important things and, and productive things I did in my sales career time that you're talking about, where I closed a billion, billion and a half, you know, 5,000 transactions is kind of how I measured it in my selling career. Um, I, I got pretty good at, Spending some quality time, uh, literally, uh, on the calendar. I put it on the calendar, and I called the customers from last month, and then I had a time where I called customers from six months ago and one year ago. Now, I was selective in who I called because we looked at the the team always had a vote, too, and we loved this family or that family, and they were so organized, and all the stuff they got us. So I'd call back, but, but the most important calls were the ones from a month ago. 
say we close 25 transactions, 25 families, um, well, maybe I'm going to close these 10 or 12 that were referred by certain people. And I may, hey, Mr. Childers, you know, calling you. Um, thank you again for, for trusting us last month. And, and you can understand why we structured the deal that we did. Congratulations to the home. Hope you moved in. Just want to spend five to 10 quality minutes and ask you a couple of questions on, and please be transparent, David, you know, what we did well, but what we could do better. Right. Well, I got in the habit of doing that. And I'll tell you one that rang my bell. And this, I'm so glad you asked this. This is not scripted, folks. And this is the kind of stuff you need to do. I'll never forget I did this one time, David. And it was a guy who was an executive with Frito Lay. He had been a several, like a two time previous customer of mine. Call him up, kind of, you know, ego out there, young, up late 30s guy, early 40s, and doing really well in the mortgage business. I'd done his business before. Hey, you know, Bob, just wanted to call, and make sure everything was okay. Any feedback this time? He said, you know, I'm glad you called, Jimbo, because I care enough about you. This was my wife's first time to hear your presentation. I told her all about the last two times when you moved us from here to there. He was a moving executive, you know, in his career. He said, but this time was different. He said, you're so strong up front. But man, this time you guys, fin- you finished weak. Mm-hmm. And I was just like, how dare you? You know, <laughs> but uh, it was so good for me because I had grown and I had, and I hadn't asked, and this guy was already a past client, might have lost him. I thanked him. I went deeper with that. And then we went and retooled some things and we figured out what it was. It was just some simple stuff, but it was huge to him, a busy executive. He had brought information to the table like you do in, in a mortgage right. thing, just like in real estate. And yet someone had called in three days later for it. The point is I got feedback and then I started doing even more and we tweaked our system. We tweaked our message. We made sure we listened. So my advice to people in doing this right now in that mindset is first go back to past clients and ask, what did we do well? Right. And please, and ask the questions well, where you get real answers. And what could we have done better for you? Not better overall for you and your family. Great nuance there of that question. And then listen, shut up and listen and, and write it down because the magic to our industries in all the technology and, and social media is important in, in messaging that, that hooks people, but we have got to make a difference at last. We have got to connect with the individual. We really need to create a great client experience. That's why we're successful at Benchmark. I mean, we, our best folks know how to do that and teach their teams how to do that. And, and that's the big deal right now. And I see a runway to do that in this marketplace right now because people panicking when there's less volume yeah. and, and they're more competitive, they kind of go to the simple things or the things they think they need to d- dust off and do better. And then they get caught in those fights or those, you know, not, not doing what they, the client maybe really wanted or needed because they didn't ask. Yeah. That's a big deal. Yeah. No, Does I, that help? I, no, that's wonderful. I, I think the, when you said, how can we serve you better? Because I think most questions Agents are doing that. I think a lot of officers are doing that. Whoever's in the business is probably going, hey, how could we have done a better job? How how are things? But not getting the answer that helps them. The, the other thing is how do you ask the right – in in these, these questions aren't scripted, but the beauty of this conversation is I know you so well because of our relationship. Can you talk just a little bit about – understanding your brand in the market and asking really good questions to understand what your brand is in the market? Because most people would say, Hey, here's my brand, Jim, let me tell you what my brand is. This is, this is who I am, but you have a unique perspective on getting that feedback as well. Yeah, it is. And again, in, in the coaching time that I did uh, when I was going to branch by way back when and all that I actually did this, you know, we're with loan officers and, help loan officers with their best realtors when I got involved that Mary Harker and I, you know, for years did this. Uh, She was my top realtor partner forever. Um, But, you know, I could go out, if you were a loan officer today or a realtor, um, I could go out, David, and just know your name, have met you today. And if I'm to coach you in the future, I could call and get five to 10 of your customers you've touched in the last six months. So let's see three to six months where it's fresh. And I could ask them specific questions and get information and literally write a small book about your brand in the marketplace. Right. It would be the right. brand that it really is, not the brand you think Right. It is. That's the right. Point. That's your point. Sometimes they align when someone's done some work or really worked on themselves, like we talked about earlier. 
but many times the parts are very different. Uh, sometimes people get lucky and it's different good, but there's parts that are missing. And this is why the big one for me is, is that sometimes we don't get repeat business from our past customers. We did an okay to adequate job once um, and it fulfilled the need, but it wasn't maybe a wow or it wasn't something that ignited a relationship longer or you know, my magic in my years of doing loans. And thank goodness I had great teaching training. I sought out mentors like a Jim Rohn to others like you, you and Todd yeah. and back in the years. Um, <clears throat> all that to say, I built something that, you know, when I started in the 80s, you know, by 2000, 2001, 2002, 80% of my business was coming from past clients versus generating new every month. I mean, you kill yourself in this business if you don't create something that makes it a little bit easier, right? And there's, that's the path you're talking about is working on something that's so rewarding because you're dealing with family. Right. You're not just dealing with a, a, a number. You're dealing, and we even call them that benchmark, you know. R.J. Crosby kind of uh, you know, came up with that phrase years ago, but how many families did you close this month? And, and that's what we call it. Um, and so identifying and connecting that through your brand is critical, I think. Um, and, and it helps, it always helps me and it helps for our company to draw in who we want to do business with long term. But first off, let's get real. You can't do business with everybody. And if you try to have a message to the overall right. marketplace, yeah. you will suffer the tragedy of serving the masses. You hear me That's clearly. A huge point. Versus getting clear on your market message, clear on the value proposition. Like back to when I was just talking about questions earlier, I was, I was part of coaching the realtor uh, loan officer team one time, and some of those questions got asked. And one of the uh, customers that had bought with a realtor said, yeah, you know, I'd love to have had way more information on schools, on churches, on uh, things within the community, not just the community. Right. That's amazing, right? I mean, super cool. Um, and, and those kind of things, sometimes if we don't listen or ask, we just go sell real estate or we go sell mortgages and we do it well, right? We know the rules, the laws, the, all these things that right. are valuable. But if the, if, the, if the cup can be taken to here, you, you go take the value proposition up and you need fewer of the right people that will go tell more of the, those type of folks in their circle and your business just never stops. Yeah. No, it's such a, such a good point. What are we missing that we're not talking about in this market? Well, I mean, I think the team stuff is huge. We, we can get more on team because for someone, if you're going to grow your business, you have to build a team. Um, you have to delegate the things you're not strongest at. You know, today's world, I would have a teammate that owns the, your database, owns your social media messaging, and aligns it with what the team messaging is, gets feedback even on that from consumers and stuff. Um, you know, a teammate that, of course, for a realtor, manages the listings, manages the, the coming in. But it, it, it's are you really all over building the best team that images your brand and the message to the marketplace? Yeah. That'd be a big one. Talking more about I mean, the marketplace, we want to get, I think we touched on the Fed pretty good. But. Yeah. Well, let me, it's always, I love these conversations, love having you on. We've talked about the market. We've talked about, you know, really what you can do right now. And then here's where I want to end. I, I want to think about this because we'll talk to a, a wide range of people. If you've got a team, you've been very clear on, hey, here's what you need to do to look at your team well. What do you say to the individual solo agent, solo loan officer, what's one thing they can do, I mean, today, to start working on their business? What's a, where, where do they start? Yeah. Because I think the, 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 the challenge of this is it's all good, but where do I, where do I start? Where do I get going? Okay. It's a simple answer, but I know you'll That's appreciate right. it. Start with time blocking. In other words, do it. Because you hear this at seminars. Tom Ferry, I mean, many yeah. people listen to this. I mean, are using greatest real estate coach out there in the world. Teaches good principles. But, you know, that busy doing what, what David said a while ago, the way you start is you have the time block. You have to go to your calendar and your team has to respect it. And from 8 to 10 a.m. or it's going to be 7 to 9 if you're an early person or it's going to be a block some hours on an off day for you normally. Um, in other words, it's okay to pay the price and work a little harder in the shorter term to have a more balanced life in the future. Uh, I used to, that's where the, the whole term, the 90-day burn yeah, came yeah. from. If you remember, I would do the 90-day burn where I was actually going to work 90 days straight, even maybe late, but have a really dis disciplined goal and outcome. That's how I created Certified Scripts and other products 
outside of my mortgage practice over the years and even some of the stuff with benchmark. So it's time block. Start with that. You need to put time on the calendar today and this week where you work on your business, not in your business. And some of you are going to freak out a little bit. you got a little ADD or ADHD or whatever, and you're like, hang on a minute. Most I have you. to be just doing something. I'm going to go bump into a wall or do something right. or re- recreate the same thing I did two weeks ago, but at least I'm busy, right? Right. But when you time block where you really are uninterrupted to think, then come up with specific things you're going to do. So I'm big on task analysis, I call it, you know, for years. Um, but the, the way to look at it is have, have the specific kind of, uh, what's the word? But look, looking for you know, what, what am I busy doing uh, in, in the, the, ta- the time that you spend on your own looking on your business? And many of you, if you'll do this, the task analysis thing you've heard me talk about, David, it's just taking at least a week, if not a month in your life, and measuring from 7 a.m. to 7 p.m., what did I do right. and what am I doing? Right. In other words, you literally write down every couple hours. Uh, right. Just spend, you know, what I thought was going to be a 20-minute client cons- consultation that lasted an hour. Okay, that's fine. But then go back and rank it. Was that high payoff or low payoff? Right. Was that high maintenance or low maintenance? You'll come up with some combination, right? The ideal combination is high payoff, low maintenance. Many times if you look for someone who's really a doer, and wants to stay busy all the time, they end up 60 to 70% of the time in situations that are high maintenance, low payoff, but the euphoric release from endorphins says, I was busy. Right, right. And that's how you get stuck being successful, but not mega successful. So that's how I would start is time blocking with assessing me and my time. And then the second one is assess relationships. Great book. Great buddy of mine, been around for a while, you know, Bob Bodine, Power of Who. Yeah. You know, Bob is, you know, the most powerful man in sports nobody's ever heard of. Guy's placed a couple hundred athletic directors. You know, I was sitting with him one time in an outdoor fireplace, and Coach Calipari calls him from Kentucky. Right. You know, he's like, hey, go. <laughs> and, and but who's Bob Bodine, right? But read his book, The Power of Who, because <clears throat> he talked about it in there after flying like 8 million miles. He woke up to the reality of doing a real self check on his database and realized really 80 to 120 people out of his database of 8,000 had really sent him over half of his income and business. And yeah, they were all great. Right. And, and those assessments only come during time of working on our business. Right. It's, it's such an important point, Jim, and even slowing down enough in our business to recognize that. So we got to wrap it up. It's always such a blast to have you on and have these conversations about where the market's at, what you can do to be successful. And Jim, you, you gave, I'm, I'm going to kind of repeat that back, two things people can do. Number one, today, schedule time to set up your time block. So you, 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 you got to make an appointment with yourself to do that in the future. First thing. Second thing, if you want to get the book that Jim mentioned, it's The Power of Who by Bob Bodine. I've read it. It's a phenomenal book about relationships, and I would encourage you to go out and get that. So, Jim, as always, we are grateful for our relationship with you uh, and what you mean to the industry at, at, uh, at large, but, but also what you mean to us at Keeping Current Matters. Hey, you guys make a big difference at last for not only us and our company, you have for me, but all of our clients and and, uh, just those listening use this tool keeping current matters it's it's one of the best if not the best accurate informational and integrous uh for for clients today so thank you i appreciate what you guys thank you buddy All all right take care Thanks for tuning in to How's the Market. At Keeping Current Matters, we believe that everyone should feel confident when buying and selling a home. And this podcast is one part of our larger vision to change the way real estate professionals educate and serve their clients. So if you're looking for more resources to help you grow your business and stand out, visit keepingcurrentmatters.com. And if you haven't already done so, click the subscribe button so you don't miss an episode. And if you love our podcast, please share it with someone you feel could benefit from the information we share. That way we'll help more agents win. Here's to your success and I'll see you next time.